Welcome back to Ryan Rambles this time around. This is the more podcast focused, no, the true to form maybe of all the shows I do where I kind of feel empowered to not shut up even more than might happen. There's no video version of this. A lot of times, obviously, I'm double dipping as far as that goes, but this is just just pure podcast. And in its <laughs> purest form, I will talk about all sorts of things, some related and some not. But right off the bat, I should mention the song I chose to intro this particular episode of Everything Went Smoothly was probably Lagwagon's Brown Eyed Girl. It was a fantastic song to bring to dances and give to the DJ. And and for the first however many seconds, if they previewed it, it sounds pretty indistinguishable from the original. And then it gets good. So it was always a fun joke to play to get some of our music into the rotation. But we also felt, or at least I did, that we had a kinship with the band because they were from Goleta, we were a mere 45 minutes away. We would often go to Glita and Santa Barbara to skateboard on the weekends. So it's strange to think of sometimes how shortly removed I was. You know, if I had been just, just maybe half a generation earlier, I might be giving you some firsthand experience with some of these bands and stories. But I, I was a, probably a, a grom of a grom at that point. So in any event, I can tell you what it was like to bring a song like that to a dance where not many people listen to that type of music. So uh, Lagwagon, always a good pull. They're, they're still out there and, and the next time they're around, I'll probably go see them, but they, they might be number two on the list. I've already talked a lot or at least mentioned Pennywise when I put up that record on the wall, but Pennywise was the first punk band I ever listened to. Lagwagon, probably a close second. I'm sure it was probably in that group of CDs that was lent to me very early on, but always a delight. I lost track of their music somewhere around double platinum, I think, unfortunately, but who knows what could happen from here on out, which is going to be a good, good theme because (laughs) depending on how I titled this particular episode, you're wondering why I'm talking about that at all, but you should be thankful. I remembered that I try and start these with songs that I can give you stories about, but for this one, I'm going to go to another story that will relate to what we're going to talk about, at least spiritually or mostly spiritually, perhaps. But it's a story I've told before, not here. So I feel okay telling it again, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. Again, this is a podcast. This is my right to to ramble, but it starts in film school. So I've certainly mentioned that before, but I have a degree in film studies from the University of Utah. It has ruined how I watch movies ever since. And in basically film 101, I think it it probably was, it was a very early film class. It was an introductory film class. So it was full of lots of people like me that would not put too much more thought into it and just end up with a degree at some point, along with a lot of people that I like movies. So this class is probably going to be interesting and or fun. And to be fair, it was, I, I think I remember loving that class. In fact, uh, I won't out you completely, but Brian M., if you're out there, uh, you might have been there for this story I'm going to tell as well. But the reason it's called a film studies degree is because I could have completed the whole thing without a single production class if I wanted to. I'm pretty sure, at least. But I did do a production class, so maybe maybe I did the bare minimum. W- what are the chances? I did take one production class. So at the very least, you can't complete that degree with one production class, which I did. But the reason I mentioned that is because it is a separate discipline. You know, I think everybody's familiar with movie reviews, obviously, whether it's official, you know, you're going online somewhere or you just hear one from your friend, you know, I guess maybe that's word of mouth at that point. But still, at some point, everybody's aware of the fact that people see movies and tell you what they think of them. But there's also actual criticism out there. Some people don't even separate those two. And theory, which I think can really fly under the radar. A lot of people don't know. In fact, this will tell you where I came from. Oh gosh, Bill Siska. Was that his name? Shout out. Was the, I believe, head of the film studies department at the University of Utah and was a big fan of Roger Ebert. Maybe this is why I'm a big fan of Roger Ebert. Actually, no, I trace it farther back than that even. My mom used to watch 
at the movies, right? Wasn't it called his TV show, which I continue to love and, and look up clips on movies that I recently discovered to see what he thinks and, and, or thought, I guess at this point, but he was a big fan. And the reason I mentioned him is because he was a, a film theorist as well. I feel like that didn't necessarily travel out to the masses, I would say with, with some of the stuff he did. But anyway, the reason I mentioned that that all exists is because it's sometimes colliding right with the mass market appeal that movies still carry and have for, I don't know, the second they were invented quite possibly. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that the large majority of the movie going public does not care about any of that stuff like criticism that, you know, reviews to some extent, certainly, but they'll even still go see a movie that's, you know, based on a property or, or a subject that they like, even if they've heard that the movie is bad or read a negative review or something like that. I love that stuff, right? I love getting real deep and stupid with some of this. I love thinking about the zeitgeist, all sorts of weird stuff. And that's partly, yes, again, what film school does to you, but I would be lying if I didn't say I was probably predisposed in any number of ways up until that point. In fact, this could almost be an appropriate time to mention how I think if I were to trace it all the way back, I got into movies was my friend, Brandon, who is a, a patron. That's the, the Brandon from the patron list worked at a movie theater. I tried to get a job at that movie theater, but it was, it was a real Nepo business, Brandon. What was the deal that his mom worked there? Uh, he, it was, it was a real family affair and I was not family. I would, I would hang out incessantly at the place. I would, I believe, sweep the floors (laughs) in just the most misguided attempt. I, it was partly just hanging out, you know, I wanted to help out my friend and we, that's just what we did. It was, if he had the job, I had the job. That's how it was back in high school. But also none of the, well, I guess there was probably some management there that saw me doing it, but very rarely. So it wasn't like I was impressing them even anyway, but he got into movies for free. We saw one like every single weekend. So I would, if I had to trace it back to, to that, I think that's probably where my, my love of film took off. But again, why I'm mentioning all of this right now is because I wanted to tell you a story about film 101. So we were I don't remember how early on in the class it was probably within weeks if certainly months. I mean, semesters were only a matter of months anyway. So let's say within a few weeks, we were studying Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. And we were talking about where the actors were located in the shot. It was the scene where Cary Grant meets James Mason's character for the first time. If that rings a bell for anybody. So we're talking about, again, where, where everybody's standing, where the lights are, both in frame and off camera, and why Hitchcock might have done or made some of those decisions. And basically, a, a guy raises his hand. I don't remember anything else about him. I don't remember hardly anything about anybody from, from college. But he asks the question, okay, not so much a question even, this all sounds great, but how much of this do you think was on purpose? And uh, it's a decent question, especially for, again, a film 101 class where maybe half of that class has got to be people that are just like, I like movies because a lot of people like movies. It's a mass market thing again. But the answer is a big yes. It, It was all on purpose. Never mind Hitchcock where the answer is an even bigger Yes, but even if we were talking about some lesser known or even less detail oriented director than Hitchcock was, which was probably every other director. But if, if, even if you count all of the happy accidents that take place during the making of a film, uh, all of the times where a cigar is just a cigar, as they say, uh, if it's in the frame, it's in the frame for a reason. That's kind of the, the golden rule or one of them, at least. And that clip made the final cut for a reason, right? So it's a yes. The answer to that question is a yes. I can't remember. I think the, the teacher told him something along the lines of you might be in the wrong room or, or something like that. But the class moved on. Where this gets really weird is when you can't turn it off for a film, for a blockbuster like Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. So to even preface that movie specifically... I've never been a huge 
Tom Cruise fan. And I'm, I want to be also really careful. I hate saying negative things about people. I do enjoy, you know, ribbing and, and, and making jokes and making fun of myself included. So it's, it's never personal in that way. I just, it's just who I am, but I, I'm just never been a, a huge fan of Tom Cruise and, and Tom Cruise movies for the most part. There are some fantastic ones out there. A few good men. Uh, I will even include Mission Impossible 3. Uh, Minority Report. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow. I extremely love Edge of Tomorrow. So there's there's plenty out there. Top Gun even, I will say, the, the original, the first Top Gun, I liked Maverick too. But the first Top Gun, I, I went full circle on it for a bit. I, I remember... Okay, I don't really remember viewing it, but I remember liking it probably like everybody liked it when it was huge back when it came out. Uh, Not that I saw movies then, so it still would have been later on than that. 84? Is that the first one? That seems really early. But I watched it again, thought, this isn't good. And then I watched it uh, before we watched Top Gun Maverick, and I've come all the way around. I'm like, Oh, this is, yeah, this is, this has all of the classic lines. You know, maybe that was part of it is by that point I had been uh, subject to a lot of the jokes. I mean, I've always liked hot shots, but you know, uh, <laughs> watching it in that order, hot shots, then top gun made me appreciate top gun more. Again, you're learning, you're probably not learning a lot about me, but you're, you know, you're getting some classic Ryanisms out of this one. But that's also why I think the Mission Impossible franchise is going to make a good touch point for what I want to talk about because it is, I feel like it's one of those movies that you can watch knowing what it's meant to be and kind of always enjoy it on some level. And I will say that about all of the Mission Impossible movies. I, I enjoy them all, but they're also a really strange group. I mean, the first one's literally a De Palma film you know, Carrie, Scarface, The Untouchables, you know, not exactly a filmmaker for the masses. And Mission Impossible 2, which we'll probably end up at least obliquely mentioning at some point because it was also a part of this wave of Hong Kong action directors coming to the States and taking on some really big budget properties here. But John Woo did Mission Impossible 2. And it's got all of the, the gun foo and slow motion birds. It's all in there. You, you can tell. And then Mission Impossible 3 is kind of when we enter the modern era, I think, with, with this franchise, with J.J. Abrams, obviously. It's, it's a full-on popcorn action film. And it basically just, the fr- speaking of the franchise, just gets more popcorn-y from there. And again, enjoyable for that reason. So whatever I'm going to say from here on out, I enjoy all the Mission Impossible movies to some extent. It's it's a fun conversation because Mission Impossible 2, I feel like you'll hear about that one being the worst, but when compared to some of the later entries where it's it's hard to latch on to an identity, but certainly an identity of its own, I feel like with some of those movies. I look back at Mission Impossible 2 and I'm like this nobody's going to mistake Mission Impossible 2 for any other Mission Impossible. You know? So I, I can respect it and I almost I almost give it a leg up for for reasons and there's always the the Hong Kong action thing. We know I'm I'm partial, but for that reason, I feel like this is it's it's a it's a good touch point and it's gonna be a fun conversation. Again, for me, I love this type of stuff. So <laughs> keeping all of that in mind, here's what really bugs me about Dead Reckoning, part one. Tom Cruise is the center of the universe again. And where I usually try to be careful or at least cognizant where I'm talking about the actor and the character, you know, I I try and and use the, I, I, I promise I do as bad as I am at it. I try and use the character's name where that's appropriate and the actor's name where it is, but I, I certainly am not perfect at that. But here I feel pretty good about either one. So, I mean, If you think about it, besides Maverick and maybe since we're talking about Mission Impossible here, Ethan Hunt, can you think of another character's, another Tom Cruise character's name? I literally cannot. Even from those favorite movies of mine that I mentioned, like A Few Good Men, no idea what his name is in that movie. 
no idea at all. I haven't seen that movie as much as maybe I've seen the Mission Impossible movie. So I'm part of the problem, but that's the name of the game here, right? This, this is what I think. In fact, some would say this has probably always been the case, but it certainly seems to me uh, that it's becoming more pronounced with, with late stage Tom Cruise, you could say, because it's not getting any better. You know, it's not waning. It's, it's again, I think only becoming more pronounced. We'll, we'll see maybe with Dead Reckoning Part 2. But I don't, let's just say I don't see this trend reversing at any point in the future necessarily. If it does, my gosh, I, I will do a whole other episode because I think that would be fascinating. And that's not going to make sense until I'm done telling you kind of all the, the ins and outs of where my head's going here. But to get there, I want to talk about something called the Bechdel test. And it's so named because it comes from a comic from Alison Bechdel, although I believe the there, there's a few people involved. Again, I'm part of the problem here because I'm not <laughs> telling you all of them, but I'm going to use it as, as a path here. The, the test itself is made up of three criteria. So number one, are there two women in the film, preferably with names? Two, do they talk to each other? And three, do they talk to each other about something other than a man? So it is a test of feminist representation in film, but you would be surprised how often, in fact, I think most films fail that test. It seems, again, it's not asking much. And also I'm not saying every film should uh, qualify, whatever, blah, 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 again, I'm using this as, as a pathway to Tom Cruise. So it just go with me for a second. In fact, I don't know if, okay, I can actually look it up. Hold on. So apparently Dead Reckoning Part 1 does actually pass the Bechdel test because at some point Haley Atwell's character speaks to Vanessa Kirby's character, the White Widow. Haley Atwell's character is Grace about the key that everyone is after. So they they have a what's probably a tiny discussion about the actual MacGuffin in the film. So you can see how it's it's I don't believe we're uh necessarily voiding the test even with this movie. And quite honestly, Haley Atwell, Vanessa Kirby, and Palm Clementif actually, freaking Manis, are fantastic in this movie. Manis especially, she can be give her, her own action movie for that matter, but she, she does a great job. I think they're all great in this film. But why I even mention the Bechdel test is because I don't even know if this movie has two people that talk to each other or even exist that aren't in the service of Ethan Hunt, of Tom Cruise's character. Look, just look at, this is the only thing you need to do. Whenever somebody dies in that movie. Okay, not anybody because the the body count isn't necessarily low, but when a character of interest dies in that movie, at no point does the movie stay with that character and does that character uh, get to own their death in, in any sort of way. All we see both on screen, but also within the, we want to talk, talk about grammar within, within the, um, like if the film were making an argument, this would be the argument it was making. All of those deaths are only portrayed in, Oh no, look what they're doing to Ethan. Like er, er, when somebody else dies, it's always within the terms of, Oh man, look how sad Ethan is. This is going to be hard for him. Not the person who has died, but Ethan Hunt. So, and like I said, this, goes farther back. I'll even I'll even go as far back as Top Gun Maverick, which was another real crowd pleaser. And again, I liked Top Gun Maverick. I, I had a great time. But there's there's this whole center piece to the film where Maverick, where Tom Cruise cannot figure out how to grapple with the situation with Goose's son, with Miles Teller's character, uh, Rooster. And again, the majority of how that surfaced in the film is, boy, this is really hard for Tom Cruise. Not Miles Teller's character. This is really hard for Maverick to go through all this, which it is. And there, there's all the, obviously a balance to be had because if it, all the way in the other direction, you're not going to care about the movie because Maverick is certainly the main characters. Movies can have main characters. That's not what this is. But he 
is connected with the, again, another great female presence in the film by way of Jennifer Connelly, who is a mother and a good one, it seems, from, from what everything we see, everything we're showed, uh, but it is not tapped at all for this situation. She is there to support Maverick and to get him through this, but at no point does she get to offer up a solution, motherly advice. Does, does she get to flex those muscles on screen? Does, does the idea of motherhood get first billing? Does not happen. Maverick needs to be the one. Ethan Hunt needs to be the one. He just seems very, again, now definitely speaking of Tom Cruise, because we know he's eminently involved in these productions. He is he's the ghost director in many, many cases, although his working relationship with was it Christopher McQuarrie we know is, is certainly more complicated, but he, he just seems so unwilling to cede any ground, even, even character wise to moments like that, to anything that, of any real importance in these movies. And where I will say, I think it is a little crafty because the, the parts given to the the female leads you could say do have the appearance of being meaty in a way you know they're not overtly portrayed as stupid or anything like that just covertly i think at times and i'll give you an example because dead reckoning again i don't think part one sorry does not buck any of these trends and i think because of it it does create some lackluster moments in the film you know there there are Again, <laughs> you can get through a Mission Impossible movie and be entertained for 99.9% of the time. So why am I talking about any of this? You're, you're in the wrong, you might be in the wrong room to, to quote my uh, film teacher. Oh, I wish I could remember her name, by the way. She was, she was very good. And also I should mention, even just structurally, I do not think Dead Reckoning Part 1 is a two-movie story. I think I get that some of this comes with the territory. You know, when, when you go and see a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, for some reason, that's the example that's coming to mind. There, There's always a moment. This happens with a lot of blockbusters, though. There's always a moment, usually towards the beginning, where it's kind of just a fun action set piece. You know, here's Captain Jack all over again. What situation has he gotten himself into? It doesn't or oftentimes won't relate to the rest of the story at all. You're just there for the ride and you're having fun. And that's great. I get some of that's going to come with the territory here. And there is certainly a bit of that with Mission Impossible. And again, I bet it's going to work too. If you like Mission Impossible films, you're going to eat this stuff up. I like Mission Impossible films, but I'm broken in this specific way as we talked about. But I think Dead Reckoning, again, just just has a little bit too much of that. It's, it's going to push that to the brink that whole idea that you're here to see all of this fun stuff. And, and for me, it, it, it shoots past the mark. So I think there's a little bit too much filler or fluff or whatever you want to call it. But I think it's also because it wants to have every single cake and eat it too. It, it kind of wants to be a Christopher Nolan action film. Actually, better yet, it wants to be a James Bond movie so bad. In fact, if you, if you doubt this for even one second... Go back and watch, I think it was the first trailer for the movie. And, and I don't watch a lot of trailers anymore because I'm sick of the entire movie being in the trailer. But if you watch that first trailer, it's almost indistinguishable from, there was a, a what was the most recent James Bond where, where, I guess I shouldn't tell you exactly what happens or how that movie is set apart from other James Bond movies. But the most recent James, Daniel Craig, James Bond, like they're even wearing like the same color suit. It's, it's, I remember seeing them very close together and being like, oh. But also that Mission Impossible trailer, it's just very much, I feel like, wants to to play in that space of a James Bond movie. But it just ends up feeding, or is fed by, this Tom Cruise at the center of the universe thing. In James Bond, he we, we all know he's a narcissist. The, the film itself is, is okay with that and is structured around that, around the admission that James Bond is a flawed narcissist character that we're still going to enjoy watch doing his thing and, and may have a little bit extra, like all, all, all props to the most recent, the Daniel Craig, James Bond movies. I think we've got more James Bond as a character in those movies than any of the other James Bond movies. Although I can't say I've seen 
or remember most of the other ones, but why this doesn't work in the Mission Impossible films is because Ethan Hunt is a saint. You know, none of this self-centeredness is acknowledged in the script or words of the film at all. So it's a real discordant tone for me at the end of the day, but I don't think I could sum it up any better than, than the actual final scene or, or next to final scene in the movie. So they've split up. Haley Atwell's character, Grace, has been given the task of, I think, doing something, diffusing the bomb, quite possibly. And by time <laughs> Ethan Hunt arrives, she, I'm pretty sure, is literally just sitting there and is like, oh, couldn't do it. <laughs> and not not only does she not get that, you know, and, and she's been portrayed as this extremely capable, almost a foil or, or, again, I know the movie wants me to think she can go toe to toe with, with Ethan Hunt, but it's, I don't, I don't buy it. No, nothing about the, what they actually do. It's more like they're, they're telling me instead of showing me. Right. So I, I don't, the, the trick doesn't work on me. And this scene is one of those reasons. Ethan Hunt shows up and she's just sitting there like, oh, couldn't do it. <laughs> I'm not, so again, Ethan Hunt has to be the man and uh, he has to save the day. But then also Palm Clementif's character, I hope I'm saying that name right as well, be, because he spared her life earlier on, ends up coming back around, I'm spoiling the movie, by the way. But again, I don't think you're, you're missing out on a whole lot. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean, when it comes to movies like this, you're long for the ride. And I don't necessarily know that knowing what happens is going to lessen your enjoyment all that much. You know, did you think Ethan Hunt was going to die at the end? No, probably not. So Palm Clementif comes back uh, and helps save the day, but dies in the instance, but also doesn't like, like there's enough time that, that Tom Cruise gets to go up to her and again, look what it's doing to him. This is really hard on him and uh, determines that she has died for long enough that he can do his thing. And I got to go, I got to do the rest of this saving the day thing. I got to get out of here. Even though we know that, you know, there's going to be another three hours of this. So it's not going to be uh, whatever they, they've set up uh, exigent circumstances. So he leaves like immediately. And it turns out she's not dead. She's fine. She's, she'll, she'll get better, which I, I'm actually glad because I would love to see her in the next movie on you know the right side, which is another thing that kind of comes with the territory, certainly since the uh, Fast and Furious movies have overtly made this their thing where even the bad guys join the team at some point, which is fine. I, I like the Fast and Furious movies too, for that matter. But anyway, he takes off. And the last thing I'll say is that this isn't, for, for those of you that are thinking this and, and bless you, this, this isn't the cowboy thing either. For, for any fans of old westerns where the, the cowboy always returns to the plains at the end, you know, think of Shane or The Searchers or, you know, probably a lot of John Wayne movies where he, the, the, in fact, speaking of criticism, is it, who wrote this one? Was it probably Pauline Kale or something like that? the the cowboy always returns to the plains you know the the camera stays with the family it stays with the product of his works which can also be self-serving you know a lot of this depends on the sincerity of the film and stuff like that and i think that that's a, a sliding scale as well when it comes to mission impossible movies but th this isn't that the the camera does not remain with our heroines the camera follows tom cruise which is quite honestly the real love affair at play here. Sorry, Ilsa or Grace, you know, any female character, White Widow, maybe, you know, they, they're all, there's, there's all that, there's that tension, but nobody comes between Cruz and the camera by the end of that movie. So that's a lot of words that, that result in, you know, why this movie bugged me a little bit, but I'm going to watch the next one. I don't think we'll talk about all this again with the next one, but I thought, you know, this is, this is Ryan rambles. I, I own this show. I can turn it into whatever I want. I didn't do an episode of cinematic last week. So I I'm always thinking about movies is the, the real problem here. I have an ongoing, I used to take notes for the other, I did a, a movies podcast obviously before and used to take just notes on every single thing I watched that hasn't stopped. I've stopped 
doing that particular podcast. So I just have reams and reams, d- digital reams of notes at this point on all the movies I'm watching. So this won't be a one-off, let's put it that way, but I don't think every episode here in Ryan Ramble is necessarily going to have to do with the movie. So in fact, I think the next next episode of Ryan Rambles is probably going to have a little bit more to do with the site, kind of a site-wide update thing, because I've, I came in real hot and heavy on some new shows and, and wanting to go back to some old ones and haven't done as much as that of that as I've wanted to for some very specific reasons. So maybe we'll get into that next time, but that's not going to be the next thing for Ryan runs. In fact, again, (laughs) I hesitate to say I want to do a new episode of chasers because I've said that before, but with any luck that it won't be gosh dang it. I've, I've, I've watched dreadnought. The next Ryan runs thing is going to be a cinematic for the movie dreadnought. So That'll be the next thing that will have me putting off a new episode of Chasers until next week at the very soonest. So look out for that. And thanks for hanging out for this. As always, you can find me on all the socials for now. I've heard Blue Sky is open up to everybody. Maybe I try that. Now I I have not, I've been doing a little bit more on threads. So you can find a little bit extra there. I do post some things on threads that I do not post on Twitter. Twitter has become kind of a place where I go to catch up with the people that haven't left yet, even though I, I don't do that very well or often at all either, uh, but also just to post when I've done a new video or something like that. So we will, all of us here right now, see you then. Sha-la-la-la-la.